with their dust and empty space. I'd have nothing helped him to remind me just the memory of your space. Take a good look at me now. And now I'll be standing here because I don't laugh. And that's all I can do. It's a memory of your space. That's not, uh, that's Phil Collins. Still be hanging here. Because the way for you is all I can do. And that's what I got to face. Uh huh. Take a good look at me now. There's just an empty space. Ooh. Take us to wait for you. And all I can do. And that's what I got to space. <laughs> Dude, I ruin, I ruin songs all day. I ruin songs like how people make songs. I just ruin them. Hello, everybody. Greetings to all of my programs out there. Welcome to Friday afternoon. Is it Friday night? I don't know. Fuck. These, this is the Pickles and Beer Guy. It's me. You take a good look at me now. But I'll still be standing here. Because to wait for you. I'll have a cold brew, and that's what I've got to face. Oh, that's uh oh. Uh oh. Look at the look at the color on this. This is terrifying. Uh, this is sent from a fan. He sent me some beer, so that's a thing that can happen. I'm a little scared. Look at that. She's dark like my soul. <laughs> anyway, greetings programs. Welcome back to Rune Hammer. It's Friday uh, evening, afternoon. It's 5.30 somewhere, right? Hi, everybody. I'm Hank Rinfernail. This is old Ingrid Bernal, the old guy who lives uh, up in the mountains, who does weird paintings, and it's good to have you guys back. And, uh, Skål. Ooh, hey, not bad. Ooh. That's actually pretty good. A special shout out to my man at Drowned Valley. What's up? If you can get your hands on some of this beer. His uh, double dry hop stuff, very freaking good. This is a little experimental for me, a little outside my zone. Look at that. It's pure darkness. <laughs> anyway, hi guys. Welcome back. Uh, hello. We're live once again. Um, what is up? Oh my God, Chris Johnson, you are going to live and you're going to live well. I'm still learning where... There it is. That's where you guys are. You're right there. Now, I've got my setup here, so later on tonight, I can actually see the comments, and we can we can chit-chat. Because you know what we do here on Runehammer. We talk a while. I spam yo ass. I just start chewing the fat. I, I go off. I rant. I rave. I rave, then rant again. All for my people. And uh, there y'all are. Now, I forgot one lesson, which I'm supposed to use the other camera. So I will remember that next time. But for now, I no longer care. The process has begun. And once the process has begun, it must not be interrupted. Or terrible consequences await. All right, Wongers. Hi, everybody. Wongers should be the, the, the new name for like people who are in the Wong fan club. Uh, sorry, She-Hulk reference. We live in a creative golden age right now, and that is a fantastic transition to what I wanted to talk about live tonight. Is uh, Well, obviously you saw the title of the stream, and um, I've got a bunch of fun announcements, but I try not to put those at the beginning, because when YouTubers put their announcements at the beginning, they go crazy! They go crazy! So I'm not going to do that. Creative golden age. All right, so like... Whoa, every week you've got your Rings of Power to watch. You've got Game of Bones to watch. You've got She-Hulk to watch. And you've got any number of other poorly made one location horror films to choose from. <laughs> Not exactly making my point, but I think you see where I'm going with this. Now, a lot of us have lived through times. Actually, screw a lot of us, all of us have been through times where we are crossing the desert of enthusiasm, that there's no stuff out there that's really speaking to us. And that speaking, that speaking to us is what I sort of call a golden age. And no house don't DM, it is not late at all. It's like 6.30. It's not late. This is a perfectly reasonable time for human beings to be doing things. Plus, I live in the future on the East Coast of America. 
So what we have what we call fresh sunlight. You guys on the West Coast get the old sunlight. We've been using it for three hours before you even get it. <laughs> anyway, it's 6.30 where I'm out here in the great city of Philly, PA. And tonight, I want to talk about how and why Heilung speaks to me, the band, and how and why they have rewired my brain. Or maybe they just wired it how it was wired before. Maybe they restored the wiring of my brain. Because I don't feel changed. I feel more me than ever. Okay, so to get some context on what I'm talking about, Heilung is H-E-I-L-U-N-G. So real quick, you can alt-tab over in your browser and look them up and get like a nice little string, turn down the volume so you can still hold Hanker and Fernail talking about garbage, but brace yourself. Now, I would not recommend discovering Heilung that way. I would wait till much later tonight Get yourself in a suggestive state, whatever that may be for you, and take some time to absorb what this band is about and what they're doing. Now, on the surface, you just like, okay, why are we getting videos on an RPG channel just about Hankerin's favorite bands? This is, is this seriously, we are scraping that empty of a barrel of content? You're just going to tell me how, Hank, I know the words to Phil Collins, and that's a live stream. No, no, no. It's more than that. It's not just more than that because Heilung has rewired my brain, as I like to say, but because of what it means for this conversation. Okay, a lot of times on ye old internet, especially when it comes to the glorious hobby of tabletop role playing, which we all know. Let's face it, it's a little weird, even if it's in its grand state of popularity, it's still a little bit weird, it's still a little fringy. I mean, there are more people like wearing shoes than there are people playing D&D, you know what I'm saying? So in that community, in that little world, we also then have an even smaller world and then an even smaller world. And they get smaller and smaller as the, the sort of interests become more and more specific. And in this case, we have people who are not only sort of just into playing D&D, just like, yeah, sometimes I do that with my friends, but internet D&D is kind of about people who are seekers. They're looking for more out of it, or maybe they're curious about the methodology. Maybe they're taking notes and they want something to spark something in their brain and so on and so forth. And so in that little community, I've noticed something lately, which in my mind is almost anathema to what is happening in the larger culture that's unfolding. And that is what I'm calling this creative, like golden age. Now, at first, when so-called geeky things got really popular, mainly ushered into the limelight by um, Favreau and the modern era of Marvel, right? That era of Marvel, really, Iron Man really brought a lot of new people into what used to be a very small interest group. And at first it was like, oh my God, this sucks. There used to be so much parking to go, you know, see stuff like this. And now they made it so good. A lot of people are showing up and like now it's all popular and I feel weird. Oh, someone feels... Someone feels the urge to do that. Dear Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Philly. Yeah, there are some people who are so insanely frustrated with their circumstances for understandable reasons that they feel the need to blast this into everyone. <laughs> I really I really feel bad for them, honestly. It's got to be insanely lonely and frustrating to just drive around and realize every single person in a city fucking hates you. <laughs> anyway... That's over. That was unpleasant. But what I was saying is that, like, at first, 
when so-called geek culture got higher quality. It like stepped up and Jon Favreau was instrumental in this shit. And he's still killing it with stuff like Mandalorian. And just his overall impact on Marvel and on nerd culture in general has been such a huge upgrade. Then you got people like Taika Waititi and others who are having the guts to reimagine some of these pillars and like, we're watching this and like, whoa. Okay, that's kind of this first step. But then it all started evolving and then COVID happened. And definitely when the pandemic happened, hanging out at home and like binging shows was no longer considered like something that a loser does, which I know if you have guys have forgotten already, but that was an, a, a widely held opinion before the pandemic that it's kind of like you're like a weird hermit when you're just kind of at home like binging TV and stuff. But when everybody did it, it really changed the game. Okay, and then once again, you kind of get this feeling of like, man, there used to be so much room here, you know? I was kind of OG, and now I'm just kind of part of this so-called mainstream. Okay, this is all real stuff. But now we are no longer in that phase. We're now in this sort of next phase. And this next phase, in my mind, has three parts to it. And that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. Because I don't have a game to recap for y'all, because we had some scheduling uh, stuff, but we're back on it after this week. Now, the three parts that I wanted to talk about. The first part is the stuff itself. And this is a lot like game recaps, okay? So when it comes to our hobby, the stuff itself is the sessions that we play and absolutely nothing else. That is the stuff itself. So if you think about like, let's think about Iron Man, okay, the Marvel movie. The stuff itself is the film. It's a two hour artifact of work. That is the only thing that is the stuff itself. Everything else is peripheral, okay? And that's the second thing that we need to sort of see to critically think about this subject. Everything else. And this is the sort of discussion. This is what I like to call dogpiling. And honestly, I don't see a ton of value in this. Now, this could just be a matter of taste, but I don't know about y'all, but I see more and more dogpiling around peripheral discussion than ever. Now, maybe it's just because the internet is more used than ever before, but I honestly don't think that is a very critical way to look at what's happening. I think that we're seeing so much conceptual dogpiling because it's low-hanging fruit, y'all. So let's bring it away from Iron Man. Let's bring it back to something that we know, okay? So the actual stuff, that is the sessions that we play and absolutely nothing else. Not even talking about them. The doing of the sessions, okay? That's piece one. That is the essence of our hobby. The purpose of all of it. Piece two is what I like to call dogpiling. Dogpiling is talking about peripheral issues that may or may not involve actual sessions. So if we're talking about like what Wizards of the Coast may or may not be thinking or doing or what the sort of status, relevance, credibility, utility of any given aspect of our hobby or of its entire intellectual sphere, its merit or lack thereof, all of these things are massively talked about. I would argue more talked about than the sessions themselves. And why? <sighs> Hate to say it, I don't wanna be mean or anything, but it's low hanging fruit. It's easier to talk about sailboats and their merits or demerits as they go by than it is to get yourself a sailboat and start fixing it and get in it and get out in the water. For one thing, when you tend to be out there sailing, there's not a lot of people that even know you're doing it. And this is something that's definitely changing in human culture, not just American culture. Human culture, I fear and worry sometimes, and dang it, you know who else was instrumental in this talk tonight is Timothy Chalamet, who I think is dope, I don't know about y'all, but he kind of expressed the same feeling. He recently portrayed a role of this movie that's not out yet where he's in the 80s. And even though the 80s has a lot of problems to it, um, he mentioned that it was exciting for him to play a character 
who was in a time before social media. Why? Sometimes I think that myself and many others are worried or even fear that we are going to a place where documenting that you did something is actually more on people's minds than doing it. Now, that is, that is a heavy thing to process. And I don't want to come off like a, a, a heel biter here. I don't want to pull anyone down or diss on anybody's fun in any way. But when uh, Timothy Chalamet brought this up, he's like, I'm worried that this is not good for us. I don't think this is controversial. I think all of us have realized that this habit of documenting that we did a thing was put upon us. Nobody ever asked for these social media habits that we have. And think about your own habits for a brief moment if you can endure the horror of thinking about your social media habits on the daily, right? They're intense. Like there's a lot of fun videos to look at. There's a lot of like posting your shit. There's a lot of wondering if your posts are going to build engagement. There's a lot of my least favorite word in this entire storm of craziness, which is the so-called algorithm, which to me is just a new word for nihilism. Well, this isn't really me. I didn't really care. I just did it for the algorithm. Oh, fuck. What? <laughs> Holy shit, man. Chaotic evil, bro. <laughs> so you dumped my ramen on the sidewalk, not because you didn't want me to have the ramen, but just because you thought ramen on sidewalk, thumbs up. Holy shit. Okay, now hold on. I'm not here to just bag on social media. I use it just as much as y'all do. It's an integral part of my life. It's how I communicate with people, man. I don't call people on the phone anymore. I message mofo. <laughs> okay, but that's just piece number two of this trifecta I wanna talk about tonight. And the reason I wanna talk about it, I wanna bring you guys into this level of critical thinking that I'm in, and I don't wanna feel like I'm by myself. It's like somewhat cold coffee that someone poured half of a beer into, and that's okay. All right, so those are the first two pieces. The actual things we do. The documenting and dogpiling of all the peripheral concepts and critiques and praises of the things that we do, which I kind of think are eclipsing the things that we do right now. And I, I, I challenge everyone to take a look at your own interests and your own life sort of patterns and think critically about whether or not that statement is verifiable. Is there more peripheral discussion about things we're doing than the things we're doing? For some, yeah, I think so. And exact, is that a problem? Is that a threat? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in what everyone is experiencing because I'm not just here to blast, right? I'm here to think critically about the topic of the evening, which is what Heilung did to my brain when I saw them live in Brooklyn Tuesday night. And that is where we need to come to this third piece. Now, don't get me wrong. I spend every freaking day on the first two pieces. I am getting ready for sessions. I am playing sessions, going over to my homie's house, picking up beer on the way so that we can play for six, seven hours, making sure I have a Red Bull so I am absolutely present the whole time and excited, right? Th those sessions are like milestones week by week for me. And the secondary part, talking about prep, talking about theory, improving systems, thinking critically about systems, thinking critically about what social media is saying about the symptoms, thinking about the leading brands in our sort of the industry element of our hobby. I, mean, I do this for a living. I have to think about these things and I like it. So I'm not here to bag, okay? So let's put away any notion that there's heel biting going on here. We're thinking critically. All right, hankering, come on, get to the pay dirt. What's this third piece? It's something I've talked about on the channel a few times, but I just got such a heavy mainline dose of it that it just blew my brain out the back of my head. Now, I knew that I had gotten the brain blown out the back of my head by this experience, 
but I didn't really have the epiphany of what I wanted to say tonight until the next day. No, it's actually even the next day. The next day I'm kind of resting, got home, cleaned the house, you know, did all those kind of things after you see like an amazing concert. You kind of just processing, play a little Xbox, you know, watch She-Hulk, have some popcorn, you know, have some ramen, you know what I'm saying? But then the next morning it was time for me to go to the gym. I throw on the headphone, kick on Halung, because I usually listen to sort of like old Norse style folk music while I go to the gym. And this first song comes on and I had like this straight up amygdala level response, yo. Like an emotional shiver went down my body. Why is that? What is this third piece? This third piece is what I've referred to in the past called source material. Source material is even better than what I thought it was before. And that's the epiphany. I thought source material was the Silmarillion. I thought source material was Christine by Stephen King. I thought source material was The Raft or Armor by John Steakley. Even the Ghosts of Onyx in the Halo novel series, that was source material to me. This, this is the, the very guts, the stories that we rally around rather than the other things we create. This is source material, but I was off by one click. Even those things, those great works, those are books about things, about myths that live in us. And I think that right now it is painfully rare that we get exposed directly to these myths that we carry around. They include, let's take the example of Christine by Stephen King. A lot of you may be familiar with this. It's a pretty short horror novel, I think from the late 70s, early 80s or so, when Stephen King was really on fire, you know. And it's a haunted car. It's a haunted car that kind of falls in love with a teenage kid and turns him evil and kills a bunch of teenagers and it's freaking awesome and it blows up, but is it really destroyed? No, because it's fucking Christine, dude. All right, cool, great, book over, done. <laughs> But the myth that is living underneath Christine is something else that came from somewhere. Now, of course, Stephen King is a novelist. He's just coming up with ideas. You think he just popped it off the top of his dome? Because I kind of don't. I think the idea of a haunted car probably came about when the first car was made. <laughs> You've got this huge heavy machine making these horrible noises. It can go insanely fast. It seems completely out of control. And people are freakishly all about it. I mean, they are enraptured by this thing. The idea of a haunted car, even if you look at the great Gatsby, there's a moment where the, the fascination with the car is greater than human life for a moment. And so I would begin to argue that source material is something that's down below even the written work that we see. And often the written work precedes stuff like movies, right? So if you just keep going down, click after click, looking deeper and deeper for source material, which by the way is not easy. The, the casual, uh, uh, the person with casual interest is very seldom, if ever, going to discover source material. It takes a hungry mind, it takes time, it takes good references from friends. It takes patience. It takes money. It takes risk. It takes taste to find experiences of real source material. Okay, so now those are the three things that I want y'all to think about to join me in this epiphany of what happened to me. Okay, so let's just get to the practical level of what happened to me. I love Norse folk music for obvious reasons. I am of that descent but also a great deal of our hobby, at least for me and my interest in it, sort of find their roots in some form of that mythos, of that culture. Of course, mixed with other elements from other places, some modern, some ancient, but it fascinates me. It doesn't fascinate me because I'm from there or that I speak this, that, or the other language. I, I mean, I'm from Guam, for crying out loud. <laughs> 
There are no druids in Guam, y'all. <laughs> so with that interest, yeah, I wound up at a show watching this band called Halem. Now, it's not hard to understand what's cool about it, right? It's these grumbling voices, but also these huge, uplifting, angelic female voices, huge, pounding drums with a big, badass, muscly, bald guy that's playing timpanis with these giant, like, antler sticks. Bunch of guys come out with shields, and uh, at the end, I mean, he brings this staff down into the middle of this ritualistic circle on the stage, and when the staff hits the ground like Gungnir, like Odin delivering his judgment, like this massive blast of white light shot out, and this huge bass hit that I swear was going to bring the ceiling down, and that was the end of the show. It was freaking mind-shattering. Okay, so that's not here really what I'm talk to talk about. It was great. Yay. But remember, this is Runehammer. This is my role-playing YouTube channel. So we got to find, well, not find, we have to reveal why this is so relevant. It's relevant to me because I think sometimes we don't even know it, but it's why we're doing what we're doing, is to feel that sensation. Now, granted, this group has to go to immense lengths to deliver this emotional and like spine level experience to your body. There's all kinds of infrastructure. There's like 25 of them. There's a whole light show. There's massive sound. It's this incredible old theater with like acoustics from, you know, the 18th century. It's madness. They have to go to great lengths to deliver this. So it's hard to just be chilling in your living room and feel that source sensation. I'll tell you what's really hard, to be sitting in a convention hall, in a, like a conference room, at a table with people you don't know, like trying to play some D&D &D and feel this magic. That's extremely difficult compared to the existential or the qualia experience, sorry, of being right there while Heilung is blasting you. But despite that difficulty, I would argue this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing as role play hobbyists. We are mining, searching for that sensation, that chill going down our spine. Now, for this to be useful as a thesis, as a statement, as something that you're going to be like, oh, dang. Man, hankering, hitting me with some heavy shit again. If I'm going to reach that level with y'all, there's got to be some kind of a, an action, right? There's got to be something actionable here. I can't just be like, holy fuck, you guys, end of video. <laughs> that doesn't work. So if we see that the stuff we're doing is role-playing sessions, we have this whole cloud of activity, which is peripheral discussion around those sessions. And then we have this Difficult to achieve source material concept. Then what's what's the instruction? What's the what's the action? What do we do? What's the prescription here? Well, I think you guys can probably get where I'm headed with this. There is a rank to these things. There is a ranking. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I, I know that nowadays on ye old internet, we're supposed to sort of just sound off on whatever topic is being dogpiled in a relatively neutral way so as not to antagonize, drum roll please, the algorithm. Lest we say, oh yeah, I never even meant what I was saying. I just said that for the algorithm because I got some views off that shit. Ha <laughs> ha, snicker, snicker, rub, yub, wee. No. We're gonna rank these things. And you already know what the rank is. The number one rank goes to the source material. The number two rank goes to the things we actually do. And the number three rank goes to the dogpiling. To the, to the swirling, to the snickering, to the gossip. So, if you want what I want, these experiences that we, I don't know if it's even fantasizing, it's more like a curiosity or it's almost like a familiarity. 
It's like a dream you can't quite remember that you want to look at again so you can see the details. I don't even know if that counts as curiosity. It's more, it, it's, it's like an itch. Yeah, an itch is a good word for it. If you're like me, then the things you should be pursuing are these, these spine level, gut level experiences that are source material, whatever they may be for you. Now for me, this is definitely like huge. I feel like this is like a turning point. Now, I've seen some bands like this before. I've seen, I, I love that you guys are mentioning stuff like Wardrina, there's Corvus Corax, there's Danheim, and several others that are amazing. And they make for amazing session music. But this was on another level. So, if we believe in this ranking that I'm proposing, the number one thing we should be doing to be good at what we do, which is why you're here watching Runehammer, I would like to think, it's why I look at the internet and track D&D stuff all the time. The number one thing you're doing is seeking these source experiences. The number two thing that you should be doing is seeking out the sessions. Tabletop role-playing is called tabletop role-playing because you role-play at a tabletop. The last thing that I think we should be doing is dogpiling topics that are hot on the internet because they gain views. I truly think that that so-called algorithmic thinking is the new cloak for nihilism. Now, nihilism might be a word that uh, not everybody is familiar with. It is a somewhat outdated word, to be awesome, uh, to be honest. It's, it's a somewhat obscure word. It comes from an ancient saying, ex nihilo nihilo fit, which means from nothing, nothing comes. And it's basically an old logical tautology, which says, if you're arguing for no reason, you're going to going to get nowhere. If you're doing things without a substantial base motivation inside of nothing will come of it. And this saying was invented because as dialectical thinking and dialectical conversation was evolving in human civilization, there were many people, smart, awesome people, who were totally willing to play the worst game I have ever heard of, which we all know as Devil's Advocate. Devil's Advocate is where you argue a thing you don't actually think. You are arguing from nothing. From nothing, nothing comes. This is where the term nihilism comes from. Nihilism is kind of saying, eh, I'm just kind of being an ass right now. <laughs> but the clever nihilist never says that. They have all kinds of interesting cloaks and tools to bring things to the table that they may or not think because it is the thing of the moment. And I'm looking right at you, YouTube. I'm looking right at you, Internet, and really every social media platform. There's a lot of this stuff. There is a lot of this stuff. But the stuff that I really dig on is when people are just like, oh my God, you guys, I did this cave thing. So I kind of I drew this cave I had no idea what I was doing, but I figured it would be a squiggly cave with like a hobgoblin at the end, but he has like a bear suit on. So I'm like, yeah, okay. So they get in there and I'm describing this waterfall and they thought that he was a real bear and they're like, we should go bear hunting. And they went in and he pulled off the bear suit and I like acted it out. I stood up at the table because I got so excited to pull off the bear suit and like, oh shit. But as we like rolled a dice on it and it was a hobgoblin that they knew from before who's actually a totally nice dude who's like a mango salesman from a nearby town, and they're like, a whole freaking encounter unfolded with all this mango talk with this hobgoblin, and they were like hanging out together, but then we rolled a random encounter on the way out of the cave, and what did I roll? Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. It was a fucking giant cave bear. What are the odds? And so all together they battled it, and we killed that thing. We got back to the tavern, and everybody drank beers, and we rolled con scores, and everybody failed, so we all passed out. It was great. That's not nihilistic. That's what I want to see. That's the stuff. Now, even me getting the dope report of the dope session, that's peripheral again, right? But the people that were there for the cave bear random encounter that blew their minds because the hobgoblin was wearing the bear skin, they were doing the real stuff. And to me, I would love to hear more talk about that. 
about what happened. And of course, I mean, I'm a predictable guy. This is the change that I've tried to make in my own channel. So I've, I've, I, I haven't been reviewing products. I haven't been, you know, sort of dogpiling the topic of the day. I've been really trying to focus just on the stuff I'm making. Now, I'm not saying I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Not at all. I watch all kinds of shit just like everybody does. I don't want it to go away. But there is a rank. The source material is the absolute shit, man. And it's not even just the novels. It's not even Tolkien, y'all. It's not even Tolkien. He's not even source material because he based his stuff on folklore. And that folklore was based on experiences. Man, you want to know shit about fairies and trolls and shit? Go camping. <laughs> that is source material. That feeling you have when you're in your tent late at night and you wake up and the other person in the tent doesn't wake up and you hear a weird ass noise. That is source material. That is the stuff that we are craving as role players is what I would argue. Now, am I right? Is it a useful point of view? Is it an actionable thing that we can apply in our lives? For me, this time, it was. Normally, pretty hard to do, right? I mean, let's, let's be honest about it. You can't get out there and experience the thing you're fantasizing about. That's not how fantasies work. We can't go to the worlds we imagine. And in many cases, that's for the better. We got people who love us here in this time. We have a life that we built here in this time that we care about. We don't want to just go be Frodo and walk across grassy fields for the next year and a half and lose everyone we love. <laughs> so you don't always want to go to the places you dream about. And that's why I don't want to call it a fantasy. It's more like an itch. And scratching that itch can be very, very difficult. But what I invite you guys to do is look deeply, think critically about what that itch may be and seek it out. Why? Because in this one case, and I, I'm, I'm telling you, this does, this is very rare that this occurs, but it just happened to me, so I have to speak up about it. I felt a sensation, a connection, a, a, a looking not back in time, because obviously Heilung didn't time travel forward to perform for me. Heilung are modern people but they're modern people scratching a similar itch. And one could call this itch ritual, or one could call this itch adventure. And I felt connected to them, but it was like sad in a way. And that's why you can't call it a fantasy. There, there was a sadness about it. There was a sadness in my heart that, that the Druid world is completely lost to us. Even calling them Druids isn't even really what they're called. That's how far gone they are. They're utterly destroyed. And why were they destroyed? Well, for many, many complex reasons. Why are people destroyed across the world at different times throughout our history? For many complex reasons. But people are destroyed and they, they do become forgotten in time or they become paved over. And you don't necessarily want to go all the way back in time. You don't want to be part of the destroyed people. You don't want to be lost and forgotten. You don't want to be dead. But you feel something. There's an itch. There's a connectivity. And after I was done, and I sort of spent that rest day, and I came back and listened to the music again, not only was the experience emotional, it just redoubled me. It redoubled me on what I want to do next. Like where I want to go with things. And I think that's why this is important to seek out because so much of what we talk about in Tabletop is finding inspiration, finding motivation to keep being inventive and creative and fun and energetic with the hobby that we love so much. And based on this ranking, I would argue the number one way to not get inspired to not be energetic, to not look forward to the next silly thing and the next hobgoblin with a, with a bear cloak on his head. The best way to not do that is to overly dwell in this dogpiling, these trends of the moment, these topics of the moment that are, that are trending. 
This, we're arguing about this one little thing because somebody picked a scab and they're grumpy about it and I'm going to sound off. Well, it's a fantastic way to not be excited the next day. <laughs> now, we all know this. This is not a news flash, and I am not hitting you with some earth-shaking shit. Everybody knows these truths. I just wanted to come out and put this ranking on this trifecta. I wanted to talk about what happened to me, and I wanted to, talk, I wanted to yell at the internet and say, show me more of type one and type two, and show me less of type three. Where my creative head's at, not my commentators. Commentators are fun, but where my creative head's at, we all have commenting that we can do. Commentators, I'm sorry, they're abundant. But just that fun, unabashed, right-brained, free-flowing creativity is where I'm at. I'm, I'm like right now, one of my favorites is Map Crow. He's sort of in that fun youth sort of, of a channel where he's just like making things and clearly is just sort of spraying these things out, just enjoying the doing of it, not worried about who did what before or how they did it or what style or what the context or the comparisons are. And there's a lot of those out there, but they're harder to find and there's a lot more of the commentators. So commentators, if you're watching this right now, rock the fuck on, but show me where that creativity at, yo. Set the commentating aside for like six months. Just drop it. Straight up. Just drop it. Show me a map of a valley, B. Why is it cool? What's on your mind? You thinking about like weird purple crystals or what? You know, like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where it's headed. And that's what I wanted to talk about. And this is how Halung really rewired my brain. I was already heading down this direction. You guys all know me. But man... It just, it was laid bare with such intensity that that couple days later, when I put on headphones and listened to the music, it was not just like a, oh yeah, that was a great concert. It was deep. It was, I can still feel the tingle go down the backs of my arms. It's the tingle at the base of the head, right back here, right back in this little zone, right back there. See, see this knobby area with all the different bumps and lumps? That's where it was, all right? So you guys, I hope that this, lights you up a little bit like it lit me up and that you don't just you know do what I did or look at what I look at or to have the tastes that I have be critical be yourself find your own trifecta of things find those zones that yeah 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 the ASMR yeah that's totally the code word for the this uh tingly lumpy sensation in the back of the head nowadays right <laughs> Viking ASMR. <laughs> okay, with that, there's no way to top the, the comedy of that uh, final comment. I bet that needs to be probably the title of the video. Uh, Viking ASMR. <laughs> that is hilarious. Talk about bringing it all together. Thank you, Alistair. Okay, and uh, thank you for um, Master of the Old Dark House for the tip, man. I appreciate that. That just bought this beer. but Actually, this beer was a gift, so that just bought another beer. Um. All right, so before we hit the Q&A, yeah, you guys, it got mentioned earlier, but check out my new release. Just came out today. It's called Aether Hammer, Aether Jammer. It's um, basically a Spelljammer ship com combat system, but I played a shit ton of Spelljammer back in the day. I absolutely love it. And so I received a ton of messages in the last couple weeks, kind of uh, frustration and confusion about ship combat in the new Wizards of the Coast release. And so I crammed and rolled my dice in my lair and snickered and rubbed my beard, my non-existent beard, and came up with this sort of simple system that fits into my overall 5e hardcore mode kind of system, which is, you know, let's just cook everything down to single dice and stuff like that. So it's like two bucks, whatever, go grab it. And if you don't have two bucks to spare, hit me up. I'll slide you a copy. But, um, Thanks to the folks who helped me out on that, by the way. But that just came out today and includes some kind of crazy art. I kind of wanted to challenge myself a little bit and try a different art style. And it was far more challenging than I thought. Got a couple other good things coming. But let's not worry about all that. Let's hit some of this Q&A goodness, okay? So put question in all caps like we used to. And if you see me looking over here, it's not because like there's a, a car catching fire or something. It would be in my house, for starters. It's because I've got a screen over here where I can read comments. It's actually really weird because I can see 
a, a sort of a ghostly version of myself over there. I can see a ghostly version of the halo. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I wanted to talk about today. So psyched about what happened and psyched about the impact that it's had on me um, and, and what's ahead. And, and bringing that, that tone, whatever that itch may be with you, that source material, that source myth, finding that tone and treating it with respect and, and dreaming about how to bring it to the table, to the things you actually do. And in this case, man, it was really on my mind, like this world before, before this sort of these people that this performance represents were lost to time. You know, what it must have been like instead of this kind of almost Pokemon-like fantasy that sometimes we, we all stumble into. I've been totally guilty of it, just like everyone else. What was the song? Uh, there's no song. It was the entire performance. Yeah, no, no specific song. I mean, it's the whole damn thing. Yeah. I think you can, oh no, you can't quite see. It's a little bit out of view, but that's okay. Earthsea books coming up again. I have not gotten to Earthsea yet. As I mentioned before, I'm still reading The Dragon Bone Chair by Tad Williams. And it's a series, so I might be in there for a while. Is the intent to roll 3D sticks straight down the line? Yes, before your race and class. Before. The absolute first thing you do, to me, in vintage D&D, is 3D six down the line. Before you decide anything. And everyone at the table does it in each other's presence and then discusses what to do next. That way the dice are at the center of every subsequent decision. Um, I'm not hooking my phone up to another monitor. I just have the YouTube stream up over here. Any tips on running Ghost Mountain? Absolutely, let's just stay with the topic of the moment. Treat Ghost Mountain like Pale Rider, right? So in Pale Rider, it's Clint Eastwood like appears out of the mountains. Uh, they never say what the hell he is. Is he an angel? Is he sent from God? I think that's the implication. But he's sort of this, he materializes. But look at the tone in that movie. Look at his tone. He's a heroic, badass, D&D style character. But his, his tone is treated with such flavor that even to aspire to it, not even to achieve it, will make you awesome. I mean, it's Clint frickin' Eastwood, for crying out loud. So you're back at the gym. <laughs> I'm always up in the... The only time I'm not in the gym is when my leg gets fucked up. Uh, as many of you know, I'm an amputee. Uh, my prosthetic leg is disappointing at times. The technology is not as cool as you would think. And if you fuck it up, you have to rest. And I have to stay out of the gym. But uh, as far as what gets me through, well, it's like I mentioned. I listen to a lot of Norse folk stuff. I listen to instrumental kind of stoner doom rock kind of stuff. I... This may sound weird, but I don't really like music with lyrics in it. <laughs> that sounds really bizarre, but that's kind of where I'm at. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, this is a glass from the old Black Raven Brewery back in Washington State. Um, what are your favorite games for a campaign? Well, that's a bit of a huge topic, but I, I mean, uh, I think it's somewhat evident that uh, I'm a huge fantasy head. I, I really like fantasy campaigns because you have a feeling of being able to just walk out across the landscape. And that to me is a fantasy I strongly hold. I, it's, it's tough in the modern world that everything is so owned and so controlled and so fenced that you can't go wander the world. Um, so yeah, the, the, the fantasy wilderness landscape is, is something I always dream of and always love playing and I think makes for great games. Um, AF Pudu, you broke the rules. That's not a question. How do you see ship combat? Uh, combat on ships and switching and doing both. Ty, that's a great question. When you're fighting on a ship with other human-to-human -human type interactions, person-to-person, -person, whatever species those people may be, that's normal D&D. &D. We, we have a million rules and a million systems we all love to, re to regulate that situation. What I wrote Aetherjammer for was specifically when ships are drifting past each other. And the, the inspiration for me is the battle in Wrath of Khan, where they use 3D space and they use momentum, they use losing power, regaining power, drifting right in front of each other and unable to do anything. 
That to me is what's so cool about fighting ships in space. Not like Star Trek where everything's like this and like beep, 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 or even Star Wars. It's more like you can, it's really actually difficult to stop a ship in space. And there's a lot of drifting and there's a lot of losing power. And then there's a lot of also vertical movement. That to me is where a simple but effective and destructive system I, I felt like was needed. And this was my offering. Um, tips for building magic instead of handing them a list of spells. Well, list of spells is nice because your player gets a feeling of grounding because you want a wizard player to feel as smart and as interesting as a wizard character. And therefore, a list of spells can be really handy. If you make magic too unpredictable, the player feels like they don't know what's coming. And that, that's not a feeling that a, a wizard character generally has. And I think that can be tough. So I think a list of spells is actually a really good thing. Just be creative with them. And also include some classics. I mean, you need fucking fireball. Don't, don't hold out on fireball. Everybody wants fireball. <laughs> Yo, meme hunter. Man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta zoom in on your monitor. This, it, this is the, the the glyph of Halung. At the show, they have a gigantic rug of this glyph. I mean, like a person is like this big, and and they they perform the show on the glyph, and the lights like twist the glyph. It's it's crazy. It's awesome. But yeah, this is their their sort of identity. Um. I know next to nothing about spell jammer. What would you read to get a good idea of the setting? Well, read the new stuff if you're into 5e and read the old stuff, which is AD&D, which is really easy to get your hands on. I really like uh, the old one. The, uh, the new one felt like a little more cheerful to me, which is kind of, you know, the, the 5e kind of vibe. Um, I really like the vibe that was going on in the AD&D days, just out of taste. I really don't think it was better. Uh, I think there's just a little more cheer and a little more like, you know, lights kind of popping off in the 5e version, but uh, whichever, you know, they both talk about the same thing, the spheres and the worlds that are out there and the mind flares and nautiloids and these sort of fish-shaped ships and this kind of mythos that they put out there. My version of it is a lot lighter. I didn't really get into world building in my release. It's more just about the combat system. Um, and they did a lot of supplements back in the day, too, so there's, there's plenty to read. Um, you said that after listening, you were inspired for the next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Heelung. Heelung. I've, I've said Heelung for so long. Heelung. Okay, so what's the next thing? Can I do a reveal? Well, a lot of the things that I do, I start and I never finish because they just don't pan out. I would say that the so-called audience probably sees 5 to 10% of the things that I do um, because I just get a long way, sometimes a very long way into a thing and I'll be like, eh, this isn't really saying anything anybody needs to hear. Um, but I've been trying to summon up another set of novels like my Legacy of Mud novels for years now. And because I am a lumpy head and I have rocks in my skull, it takes me years to really compose what I see as a, a novel with a lot of potential. And that is still what I'm scratching at. I really want to do that. I love doing RPG stuff. But it's been now several years since I've released a novel, and that I don't like that feeling. I really want to slam it. Retune was my last one. A bit of a weird digression because it's choose your own adventure, but a world that I'm still developing. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, what are your favorite games for camping? Like fireside games? Oh, I don't know. Drinking beer and poking the fire with a stick. Uh, play a lot of the grocery game if you've ever played that one. Uh, you know, where you say, like, I went and got some eggs, and then I got some butter, and then I got some cheese. You play that game. I love that game. Is uh, Powered by the Apocalypse a thing for you? You know, Dungeon World opened my brain a ton back in the day, but when I tried to bring it to the table and tried to do some prep work and stuff, I just felt so clunky. And then I realized I had completely missed the point with GM moves and really missed half of what made the design innovative. And all I was fixated on was a fixed target for the rolls. I thought that was so cool and mind-bending, and it sent me off on this amazing journey that I've been on ever since, but yeah, I haven't really been all about it ever since. Um, have you read Kelavala? Tolkien apparently listed as one of his primary, li uh, I feel like I've heard of that. Uh, when I was into my real historical phase a while back, I may have read it. I was reading the, 
the sagas and the Edda and the Havamal and all that stuff. And, and I get, again, I think it's, it's that interesting feeling that, that what you're seeking isn't necessarily in the past. It's, it uses modern context to see this itch and it, it's, it's complex. It's psychological. Um, so yeah, like Havamal and stuff did not scratch that itch. Even the sagas and stuff didn't. I know those are sacred to a lot of people. So I don't want to say, you know, like poo on that. It's just, it didn't, I didn't find my way through there. And so I'm still sort of seeking. Oh man, Retune is just crazy. <laughs> Thanks though, Andrew. Um, yeah, I have seen Iron Sworn, yeah. Wow, hey. I'm done for the moment. <laughs> I gotta remember to flip this camera so I get the super 8K camera or whatever on the other side. Um, am I allowed to write short stories in your settings? Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And if you want to publish and stuff, just hit me up so we can, you know, word the credits in just the right way. And absolutely, I love my worlds to grow. That's super exciting. Last one got buried, but I heard Chutney. Can you bless it? Chutney is downstairs. I could probably summon him up here. Hey, hey, Chutno. Chutney? Hey, dude. <laughs> He's rebelling right now. He hates when I do this, by the way, you guys. Chutney hates when I talk at this inanimate object. It must be impossible for him to parse out what I'm doing. But he really, I think he thinks he's in trouble whenever I do a live stream. So I feel a little bit bad about that, but it, it is reality. <laughs> like he doesn't just hang out on the chair back here. No, no, no. He, he doesn't like it. He thinks I'm yelling at him or something. Um, yeah, yeah, never lyrics and stuff that may sound weird that I don't want you know like uh, you know vocals in my music but that's just where I am I like I get very you know into a think space when I'm listening to music and if there's like a bunch of words and everything I kind of get lost in it um, so I really like instrumental music it's another thing that I like about Heilung is that I can't understand what they're saying and I like that part I'm kind of inventing what they're saying in my head I don't know if that's you know culturally approved as a behavior but it's just something I do it just enriches the listening of it it's I, I love listening to face as well the uh the russian rapper who disappeared right before the ukrainian war was unleashed by russia and there's a lot of uh, dark sort of stories about that because face was very critical of the russian government but i love listening to his hip-hop because it's all in russian and it's dope it just sounds awesome and you can kind of just drift in your own head um, rather than like you know getting those earworms with lyrics do you enjoy samurai fiction and art? Um, I definitely find interest in sort of feudal Japan and all that stuff. For some reason, I, I have a hard time getting my bearings in there. I, I, I love it. I'll watch it when it comes up, you know, like a documentary about Nobunaga or something. Um, I've got a loose working knowledge of Japanese history, but I can't say I really know much or really delve into it that much. It's cool, by all means. It's, it's wild, I'll tell you what. Um, how do you see fighting ships and hand-to-hand -hand at the same time? Uh, it's just an action. I mean, if I want to stab a guy, that's my turn. If I want to twist a cannon around and try to shoot the ship that's over there, that's my turn. I mean, remember, I do everything in clockwise turns. I don't care if we're role-playing or on ships or fighting on a deck or anything. Just what's your action this turn and let's resolve it from there. So if you check out Aether Jammer, that's not a plug. But if you check it out, it, there is a column in the in the the PDF that basically says ships don't do things. Without crew mates, ships do absolutely nothing. They just sit there. They're just bricks. It's it's crew who do things with their turn. That is what happens in ship combat. Ships don't do things. That's like in Star Trek. In Star Trek, there's like two thousand people like operating this ship. So Picard can be fencing with somebody like while they're doing a crazy maneuver around the sun. That's not so in fantasy space combat. In fantasy space combat, I see the crew of a ship being three people, maybe four people. So what they do with their time is the game. Making a story your own, the way it, it's the stuff. Well, I think my epiphany, Nathaniel, was make sure that you seek out and value whatever that source material may be for you. Like the, the talking about D&D &D and calling it good for the day is probably not going to recharge your creative batteries very good. 
And for a lot of people, playing a session also can be somewhat draining sometimes on your creative batteries, right? But if you really want inspiration and you really want to renew, you know, refill the well, as Pablo Picasso said, finding what is source material for you is essential. And it's really a search worth doing and not going to be easy, I reckon. Aha, I've finished my work once again. And what is it, about 7.30? Oh, we got a couple more minutes. We can hang out a few more minutes, guys. Yeah. I mean, why not? I'd also like to spend send a very special shout out uh, to my girl Vampire Kitten out there in Kansas City. So uh, she actually hit me up recently talking about um, a project that she really likes playing with her friends of mine that they play in the bar. And that set me in motion to do a, a, a whole new project made for that exact purpose. And now we're going to be proofing that. I'm proofing it with her. I also sort of put a version of her into the game. It's a card game to be played in the tavern, which is something I've been musing about for years. I think I may have finally cracked the code on that. So watch for that. But thank you, Vampire Kitten, for the push. I appreciate that shit a lot. It's a, it's a great case study in how important it is to directly contact people and creators that you see out in the world, just directly contact them, holler at them. They're human beings and, and they love to hear from people. Um, you seem like a free floating creative type. Yeah. Have you ever had trouble playing with someone who seems to need rule structures? Absolutely. I can't do that. I go insane. I can't, I can't deal with that. If they have rules acumen and it's still s slick and smooth and keeps everybody having a good time, then I say rock on with the rules acumen. Um, but generally, uh, it's difficult for me, and I would also be extremely difficult for them. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. We don't all have to order the same cheeseburger. Um, how do I represent a lizard man city that's believable? That's a great question. <laughs> oh, man, a lizard man city is going to be like Tenochtitlan, right? Uh, it's going to be like a Mayan city. So I would think Mayan, you know, like Tikal, like a, a Mayan pyramid. And there's a bunch of lizard men gathered around the bottom. And then there's a couple of them that have like weird colored paint waving their arms around doing weird shit. That's about all you need. You don't need to show lizard men grinding corn to make flour. You don't need to show lizard men like, you know, hoeing crops. You know, they just eat cockroaches. <laughs> don't, don't worry about, you know, a believable little micro-civilization. But I think, yeah, there's like some kind of Mayan kind of inspiration going on there. The only reason I don't say Aztec is because everybody does Aztec. You, you know, like, dig deeper. Be cooler. Go to Nakhlan with that bad boy. Go to Tikal with that bad boy. I mean, actually, some of the, the Aztec inspirations are really cool, too. Um, I mean, you have, like, the Lake City. You have, I think, Tulu is Tulum Aztec? Yeah, so just some, get in there. Get into those cool, blocky pyramids. I mean, that's what we did with the uh, Fangs of Kilvestri. We had a, a huge lizard man civilization that was like jungle-inspired snake worshiper types. And it was super cool. Our characters were also liz <laughs> lizard men. Lizard men everywhere. My Inca tech. Oof, I don't know if I like that. That's got a bit of a Mel Gibson feel to it. You ever find yourself in Europe... Consider yourself invited for a beer. Yeah, I'm definitely getting to Europe when it's uh, when there's a facilitation to get there. Um, there's a lot going on in our teeny little family, uh, just like with everybody these days. And we got to handle the biz before we can get into the shiz. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I definitely got to get back to Europe and say hi to everybody. Gubat Banwa. I love the sound of it. Gubat Banwa. That, the, I think this is uh, the, the third or fourth time that Gubat Banwa has come up. I got to check that out. Yeah, what's up, oldest mate? You're going to have a hard time living up to that name. Because no matter how old you are, there's always somebody older. Unless you are the Earth's oldest person. In which case, previous statement should be disregarded. <laughs> then you will be the oldest mate. <laughs> Since you say contact your creator... I'm published novelist in Germany. Right on. Can I write hard suit tie-in novels? Uh, absolutely. Just work with me a little bit. Work with me so that we feel good about it. So that you can benefit from my signal. Let me put it that way. 
But yeah, just hit me up directly if you're getting into that writing and let's figure out how we want to do it. Hell yeah, that sounds awesome. Uh, Jeff Kahn is in Charlotte, North Carolina, November 11th to 13th. I will be there. If you can make it there, we will be playing uh, the new Warmaker War Decks that I'm putting out. Uh, it's like a card-based wargaming kind of setup. And we will be playing Mugs, my new tavern game. So, And maybe who knows what else. But if you look up Jeff Kahn and you don't see any games hosted by Hanker and Fernell, that's because I don't do a lot of the sign-up kind of stuff. I've always found it to be a little weird. So I'd rather just meet people in the hallway or at the pub or whatever and get to talking and get to know each other and let a game organically form and go to a table. So that's kind of how I do things. So it's kind of just need to, you know, like shuck and jive with it a little bit. But yeah, that con is going to be a real hoot. Uh, I need a name, please, because I need more fantasy novels. I'm not sure what it... Oh, oh, asking Greg Cthulhu about his work. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, well, I think that might be it for tonight, y'all. I hope y'all gleaned something from my experiences that it isn't just uh, ranting and raving about what happened to me, but trying to take a critical look at something that we're all sort of watching and absorbing week after week, but how there are punctuated experiences that are more inspirational than others, and that maybe we can seek them out to continue to refuel our creative batteries for being awesome tabletop players. So last one, how would you handle the burden of endless rules when playing with first timers? If you're playing with somebody who's playing for the very first time, the last thing you want to be doing is telling them about rules. Get to the essence of what's fun, which is rolling dice on a target, announcing things, describing them, and getting results. That is it. All other rules are meaningless if it's the first time someone has ever played anything. It's all just bleh. They need the guttural, limbic, emotional experience of fun, of describing, rolling, and getting results before any rules are interesting. When they start to get a foundation for that, the variation, the bending, and the breaking of those rules in all kinds of different synergies becomes interesting, but not the other way around. All right? So, bang! Thanks, you guys, for tuning in once again on a Friday night. I'm Hank Fernell, Ingrid Bernal here, your old buddy. Living up in the town of Philly, PA. Coming straight at you live and direct. Keep an eye out. We're going to have a uh, hard suit and our OSC group. are going to be kicking right back up. Not missing a beat. There's a ton of miniatures back there i got to finish. And that's what it's for. So uh, stay tuned. Have a great weekend. Remember that rule, man. Get out there and do something nice. Just one little thing for one person. If we all do that, everybody is going to be a way better world than it was yesterday, okay? So keep it real, y'all. I'll see you on that internet. Until then, peace out, y'all.